All right, here we go. We have Alan Gunner Lindblom, a uh, former street soldier of the Detroit Mafia, a.k.a. the Detroit Partnership. Uh, welcome to Vlad TV. Hey, thanks for having me, man. We've interviewed a lot of Mafia figures over the years, but never anyone from Detroit. We've done New York guys and so forth, but Detroit kind of has its own interesting story. So before getting into your story, I want to get into the whole history of the Detroit mob. Now, the Detroit mob started in the early 1900s. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Okay. And it was a, a group of brothers that actually started it. Yeah, I mean, there was kind of a, it was a little more than that. The real Detroit partnership was formed when you had, yeah, there was the brothers. I think they were called the um, Andam, Andamo brothers. But a bunch of Sicilians had beefed out, they called the East Side Gang, had beefed out with these, some Jewish gang and the River Gang, which is a whole nother gang, and all these gangs. And then what happened, over the prohibition, trying to get alcohol in from Canada, sneaking it over the river um, on, on, on the ice during the winter, on fast boats in the summer. And they were selling all this stuff to um, like Al Capone and New York, New York mobsters. And they're, you know, this high-end liquor coming from, from Europe, which they'd funnel it through Canada. So there's this huge, massive fight over who's controlling the river, the Detroit River, come and get in from Canada. And so basically all these gangs are fighting. And so one of these, these guys decided, um, I think it was William Vito Toco was the one, which would be like a great, great uncle of mine, to said, let's, let's band ourselves together, force the Jews out, and then structure ourselves as a team, force all the little guys out, and build this partnership together. And that's kind of how it started in the you know, 1920s, 1930s. That's my understanding of it. Yeah. Okay. And, okay, so uh, William Black Bill Toko, he actually was the one that kind of solidify the Detroit Mafia in the 30s. Yeah, him and his first cousin, which would be Uno Zarelli, I'm pretty sure there was either cousin or they actually, I think they married, one of them married the other one's sister and they became related that way. But yeah, they basically were the facilitators of the designers of, of ending this war and building something that's much more um, corporate-like is basically what it did, they did. And and looking at like Lucky, Lucky Luciano's formula of building something that's rather than fighting and killing each other over a resource let's all work together and make a bunch of money and form this very secretive thing and Cosa Nostra is you know it's a very romantic um thing and they they're you know they're very secretive especially in Detroit there's, there's nothing more there's never been a more secretive mafia family or borgata as it's called than Detroit so they you know they brought in their their kids and their nephews and, and their family and trained them from very, very young, just like I was, to, to, uh, on the rules of Cosa Nostra, on the rules of the kind of romantic parts of it where you get the respect and the honor and the dignity, you respect the women, and you know, if you break the laws or the rules, this happens, you, know, you, you always work together as a team, you, you, know, you, you always manipulate the system, meaning they're always go aiming at putting judges in place, always aimed at putting um, politicians in place long term, spending a lot of money and time to get politicians put in place and, and lawyers and judges and all these things. So down the road, they, they can, you know, their power is in place. And they, uh, and Detroit has mastered that. I mean, they're just the, the, the masters of doing it like that. 